Okay, folks, Monday, the 22nd of January, 2024. And we're going to have a look at the week ahead here. Sponsored by Financial Juice, the best Squawk real-time service. I use this service. The guys in uh, Duggan Capital use this service for breaking and real-time uh, news and macro events and uh, economic releases, all that sort of stuff. Uh, we really like this service. So do check it out for discount code in the description below this video. And we also have a sponsor, Earn to Trade. So I know the guys who run this firm, um, there is a firm behind this um, as well that it's all real. These, this is really the best funding platform that we know of. Um, a couple of the guys in Duggan Capital have uh, used this before and they, they think it's really good. Uh, Earn to Trade, we highly recommend this as a funding program and they're running uh, some pretty decent discounts for getting funded up to uh, 200,000 on your account. So go and check it out. Discount descriptions below in the links there. So let's get into it. All right. The economic data for the slate ahead this week um, is pretty decent going into Thursday, Friday. We do have a lot of earnings this week. So 26% of the S&P is announcing earnings this week. Um, but before we get to that, let's look at the slate. So Wednesday, manufacturing service, PMIs, crude oil at the usual half free. Thursday, um, Christine Lagarde and the boys and girls at the ECB will be giving us an interest rate decision at quarter past one. That will drop and then we'll get their um, press conference with the vivacious Christine Lagarde at quarter to two GMT. But um, in and around that, we're going to be getting the US core durable goods month on month tier one data. GDP there at half one quarter on quarter and initial jobless claims also at the same time. And then three o'clock new home sales. Friday, core PC, uh, which is the Fed's uh, preferred uh, look at the um, inflation picture and the headline PCs to come there at uh, half one on Friday. So Thursday and Friday, the big focus for this week. Hence, uh, we're, we're not really on the markets today. And that's that's why I'm out late with this one um, on Monday. So looking at those earnings to come, really tomorrow at uh, Netflix is the big one that a lot of people are going to be looking at. Oil services company Baker Hughes, Halliburton as well. Uh, Lockheed Martin obviously making a fortune out of selling those US rockets all around the world uh, at the moment. Uh, GE, 3M, Verizon. Then going into Wednesday, AT&T, ASML, Tesla, the big one, going to be hotly watched after the close there. Um, you know, Netflix and Tesla are going to be after the close. And and then Thursday, Intel and Visa um, post uh, market. Um, you're seeing Alaskan Airlines there as well. Um, I wonder how their earnings are going to be looking at, you know, obviously this um, 737 MAX situation happened um, kind of into the tail end um, of, well, of the last couple of weeks, but they're going to be announcing like Q, Q4 full year earnings here. So um, then they have Blackstone Group on Thursday, um, pre-market and then Friday, American Express um, coming in before the open. And uh, nothing else really too interesting there. Uh, so moving on. All right, Ronnie DeSantis, uh, he's out. He's out and he's endorsing Trump. And uh, Nikki Haley can go and swing for it. Like, so really, Nikki is just, we don't like Nikki, to be honest. We don't, we're not a big fan of Nikki. She, um, as you may recall, was in the UN uh, going around trying to petition all of the countries to um, vote against uh, ceasefire, vote against peace, and really to stand with Israel. So Nikki is definitely the recipient of a couple of big fat checks from um, from uh, Israel, I, I suspect, and uh, that will be listed. But uh, nonetheless, the inevitable is this is a Trump election. This is a Trump election, guys. And DeSantis is out. Haley is soon to be out. She just doesn't, she's dead. She just doesn't know it yet. She's refusing to sit down. Um, she's rallying into this. And um, yeah, look, I think once we come to November, if Trump doesn't win, and Biden gets elected. That with with his current polling numbers, I just it's this is not going to happen. And it, and and it, if Biden is elected, there's going to that, that just is not going to make sense. And Trump, um, Trump and his followers, who will represent at least fifty percent of the entire nation, you know, as Jamie Dimon says, you know, how can you stand there and 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 argue with you know the guy over your fence? Um, you know, it's it's like, just like you know you have to accept that election. And now if Trump doesn't get in though, there is going to be massive civil unrest in the US. And I, I think this is going to be a big problem going into Q1 2025. I think um, I think the Democrats are going to pull all sorts of weird shit and they're going to try, and, to try their utmost best to keep Trump out. So then they might even uh, do something like the election. But either which way, I mean, he is Teflon at the moment. There, nothing can stop him. I mean, and I don't come at me saying, oh, Tim, you're a Trump supporter or you're against Biden. I, 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 I'm indifferent. I 
couldn't care less. I'm, I'm just I'm just here trying to make money. Um, okay, 2024, big election year. So I've talked about this in the lookout for 2024. Go and check that video out if you haven't checked that out. Um, really good call in the uranium ETF. Back of the net. Thank you, Tim. Um, but 2024, so th this is the biggest electoral year in the history of this planet. And um, I think it's 100, 120 uh, elections will be held. But uh, this month, you know, we're working towards the US elections in November. Um, but you've seen at the moment, we have Bangladesh, Bhutan, San Martin, uh, Taiwan, Comoros, Liechtenstein, Tuvalu, and Finland president uh, will be announced uh, on the 28th of January. But I just wanted this as we go through the year as, um, you know, pockets of instability could kick up in and around this. Um, okay, here's a really good article from uh, Bloomberg. It's uh, entitled, a Persist uh, sorry, A Pessimist Guide to the Global Economist or Economic Risks in 2024, right? So there's quite a few different sec sectors is covered in this um, and I'm going to go over a couple of them. So what was driving oil price since the Middle East war broke out on October 7th? Okay, so this is really interesting in that um, we've had hedge funds net short 66 million contracts all the way up until about two weeks ago and if you're a follower of John Kemp um, who is the senior energy reporter at Reuters, he uh, noted that uh, last week, the at the start of last week um, hedge funds had flipped from 66 million con uh, sorry, 66 million barrels um, short uh, of uh, oil, WTI, to actually now being 55 million long. Okay, what's had us kind of sticking around like a bad smell around 73.60s, 73.30s, sorry, 71.60s, 73.30s, in around that range is that supply contribution is biggest contributor to price is at the moment. So this is noting that, you know, in yellow, supply has really been plentiful. And I talked about this back in October. I said that this, um, um, this Middle Eastern crisis was not a supply risk and it wasn't. Israel is not a major player. Palestine, Gaza are not major players. You know, if you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about like Iran, if you're talking about Saudi, if you're talking about, you know, a little more in the Southern Levant, south Southwestern Levant, like Jordan, Egypt, these are supply risks. All right. But, but Israel, give me a break. You know, Lebanon is not either, you know, that's not in the picture. So there was never really a supply risk there. And that's why we were sellers on 92 and we're happy that we were. Okay, moving on here. Um, we'll just keep here. Yeah, okay. So just wanted to note this. As you've all heard before, China coughs, the world catches a cold, right? And so this is a chart noting the contribution of uh, towards GDP that the Chinese real estate sector has. Pre-COVID, it was about 25%, 24.5%, right? Uh, yeah, just call it 20, 24, right? Now we're down at seven, or sorry, now we're, sorry, now we're down at uh, about 19%, maybe, yeah, 19 even. So the point of me highlighting this is that if this situation gets even worse in China, there will be knock on effect to the Western economies, you know, and I just wanted to note this because this situation is just bubbling away in the background the same way as the as the commercial real estate situation, it's just bubbling away in the background, it's hanging around like a bad smell, it just won't get resolved. We are not getting blowouts. Something else to be mindful of here, right, is the carry trade. A really brief one on the carry trade is borrowing yen so so say you want to buy um, a farm in uh, Texas for 10 million so you want to buy the farm in Texas for 10 million and you think you can make a, a 10 percent yield on that a year you know you can you can bring in um, a 10 percent profit on that a year right a yield on your outlay okay so you would go to Japan and you'll borrow the 10 million in Japanese yen at a super low interest rate all right and then you'll bring it to Texas where you can and buy that farm and that and you will yield like a 10% return on that. So you're borrowing at like say a half a percent and you're making a return of 10. So you're making nine and a half in, in, in the split. So that's what's called the carry trade, all right? You're borrowing in low uh, low interest currency and you're, you're spending it to acquire assets in a high uh, interest return uh, environment. That's the carry trade. Now this is coming to an end because the Japanese uh, yen is actually now starting to get a bit expensive. Okay, so the government um, ten-year yield is now kind of they're, they're kind of coming off what's called the yield curve control in Japan. Right, so just wanted to be aware of this. This is this is almost above my pay grade. This sort of stuff, it, it pretty much is above my pay grade. This is going to have a bit of a shake up and a bit of an impact. Okay, just to note, Japan holds four point one trillion of U.S. debt, point one trillion U.S. treasuries and other high yielding assets. Right, so just keep an eye out for 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 what could happen there. If they start this. Um, OK, 
Okay, moving on here. Um, big hairy risk will remain in 2024 and probably in 2025. It's just the sort of Damocles here is the global risk of a Taiwan war. Now, just to give you a flavor of how much of an impact this could have on global GDP, negative 10.2%. Why is that? It's because 90% of the world's high performance microprocessors and chips uh, are made in Taiwan by TSMC. Buffett was invested in TSMC, then he got out of it because of the geopolitical instability that could, you know they could have been invaded. And if China does invade Taiwan, the uh, the sovereignty and the and and the uh, the freedom that they've had from China since 1948 or thereabouts, if that happens, those microprocessors processors, the supply chain on that is broken. Who you are not going to be able to know are if they're going to be able to any more chips, maybe never again. And so this is why the U.S. has now got the Chips Act and all this stuff, and they're trying to now develop the same sort of uh, technology, you know, be able to develop these chips um, in the US rather than be rely so reliant on Taiwan. Look, if China invade Taiwan, you are never, you're not going to be able to buy like a, a NVIDIA 3080 or a 4070 or 4090 for anything less than like two grand. A 4090 is going to run you about two and, a, two and a half grand now anyway, but like that price on that is going to go to like six grand. All right. If you want to get like your Intel i9 14900KHS, whatever, uh, CPU, it's going to triple in price straight away if this happens. So this kind of gives you a flavor of how much of an impact this could have on the entire global economy. And then finishing off here on the macro, China defies sanctions to make Russia its biggest oil supplier in 2023. Just to note here, how much oil has Russia been shipping to China? Uh, about 107 million metric tons of crude. So the big boys trade uh, oil by the ton, okay? And they mainly do it in swaps contracts. They're not doing it on NYMEX, um, but they ship the equivalent of two 2.14 million barrels, million barrels day to China. That's a lot of oil. That is a lot of oil, okay? And so this starts to explain how, you know, cut after cut from OPEC has just not been able to spark the like rally to $100 again that a lot of people were talking about, you know, two months ago, or three months ago, all right? And this is why, okay? So, all right, look, enough of this, enough of this lollygagging. All the links to these articles will be um, posted on the description below. Um, but let's just get over and have a look at the chart here. So uh, look, uh, going left to right, looking at NASDAQ, you see NASDAQ here on the daily bars. And um, these are non back adjusted charts. Okay, see, so, I mean, just the rip that we've been on here since really the 26th of October is just phenomenal. Okay, on this chart, like we just kind of um, have a look at Santal gain here to where we are right now, it's 23.65%, 3.65% phenomenal run. And actually, if we go back to October 2020, I mean, this is just incredible here if we go back to there to where we are now it's 66 percent you bought that low okay just phenomenal stuff now uh oh and uh, some of my hard time frame still coming on there but really where do i see where we're going here i don't know i mean i think i just think this santa rally has been absolutely breathtaking and i just think the market is way fuck out the front of its skis right now to borrow a term Paul tudor john it's just way out here right so i i think we need to pull back we just need to pull back man just a little bit and um, where would it be? I think the breakaway from the 16974s has been so crazy that, and it hasn't looked once that, I don't know, it just feels like an area we need to come back to, then then probably recall the buyers to say, okay, you want to do this? Fine, let's go. And then we go higher. Um, so picking levels on the NASDAQ, really hard. It's it's more of a market I would like to scalp um, on a, any given day rather than kind of take positions in. Um, same with the spoos. you know, we're breaking up here through that 4841. Um, we were looking for this downside level 47 46 is i think uh, a couple of weeks ago and um, got it and then we're rallying up out of here i mean i'd rather go to the 30 minute this system here and we can see that today um, you know the rally has just continued there from friday into today albeit the it's a little bit in trouble at the moment you see it just hovering around vwap here broke down pull back nice short there and pull back again now it just doesn't know what it wants to do but i think there's a lot of pre-positioning here coming into the earnings picture uh, to be honest and look i think nasdaq down to 17403s ultimately here um let's have a look on this chart book yeah look i think down to 7403s and i think beyond for the pullback i think we need to test uh way down to like 17165s maybe yeah i think the buyers could come back in here 17165 for sure and um, but we have to get there first all right so I, I don't i don't like buying these things as high as they are uh you could easily see this pullback to 17403s bought and then we rally but i just don't i just don't like that uh you know spoo 
again back to 4862s i think look in the breadth of the week is really what we have to be looking at here could we run higher to the 45 49 d4s on spoos i mean we could do anything man uh but these are all back adjusted levels here so the so the back adjusted all-time high is actually a 31 half that's the back adjusted all-time high non-back adjusted uh high uh, has been already here um and that was taken out on the uh, 4808s right down here so look i think a little reversal into 4841s okay 4841s and then we could rebid and then we could rebid um you know if we can't rebid off of the um 4841s then we're gonna fail and we're gonna fail down and go towards 4639s and that's that i think that's that um uh yeah all right so moving on here looking at the dow and uh get the daily up here yeah you see that back adjusted all-time high 38.280s there this morning so we have a new back adjusted all-time high which is the high of day today 38.302s mark it up and so yeah that's a bit of that feels like a bit of a target there on the dow i think look the level on friday that i wasn't expecting to trade 38.041s was you know came in there and um, see the target that we had up there and i was looking to short that but um that was actually on friday during the session but i was gone by four and it hit up into that level at half six so you know i wasn't on the desk for that one but uh, it kept running man i mean really 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 strong markets uh we were looking for the long in and around vwap around down here um 37.664s on friday uh didn't come in well it came on to that level and um, didn't get the imbalance pullback and go on vwap it really wanted to take that 37.664s what is that level i hear you ask well it was the bottom of this range so you can see here the range that's been playing out on the dow you know was 37.664s then we breached that to the downside came back and then on friday it did that basically broke broke over and then pulled back into it support so here broke over pulled back into it support go we went okay really really nice uh range uh trade to get back in there once it came back inside the range right lovely lovely stuff oil all right so china's been selling a whole lot of oil big whoop but here's the shape of oil right now here's the shape this 7360s has been a big 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 level be looking at for the past past like month here to almost two months now and but ultimately you can see this pressure area and i was talking at length with the guys last week saying normally when we come into areas like this when we compress down and go sideways we would exit the way we came in to the downside but with oil i said it feels different because it feels like we've hit a hard landing on the 69.9 or 67.98 i talked about this live on twitter i think 67.98 and i was out of shorts into that and josh young or if you're listening at bison interest you know this is the turn target i was kind of trying to talk to you about to me dude and everyone else on twitter <laughs> it's a lot of people blocked by josh young for absolutely no apparent reason anyway uh so look we're going sideways i think this is the turn area right we turn in this area it's out okay and so where's the target 76 90 set the breakout breakout boys lovely jubbly uh so what is there to do until we get to 76 90s uh not very much not very much uh we could easily now pull back to about 73 30s find refine support and then keep going up and um, it's not going to be a straight line to 70 77 but we will get there this week for sure for sure uh what else i'm short gold i'm staying short gold for now um it's balanced down here shorted the high on day there on friday really nice little trade there really nice trade did that live with the guys in the room looking for the payout um i'll be happy if we just get down to 2012 and then i'll try and run it a little lower but um I'll, you know money's already in the bank on this one uh, you guys so um i just i just think it's kind of feels like it's kind of tough here and actually this is sort of a head and shoulders i'm not a head and shoulders guy but um feels like it. uh what else the bonds the bonds the bonds i tried to tell you about the bonds would you listen now uh so here's the bonds rally 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 pull back into the 110 24s here and i think it's time to now finish with that pullback and we go up um i am open to the 108 22 halves i am not in position on these bonds yet just didn't give me the 110 24s there on uh, friday um but that's that's that that's all she wrote um and yeah that's it that's it oh bitcoin we, we won't go anywhere without bitcoin right now bitcoin uh yeah so ultimately we broke let me see if i get like weekly bars here we go look at this look at this big bull or sorry big bear flag right bear flag we dropped out of the bear flag pulled back to the bear flag uh when we were above 45s there 44 5 48s sell it down i think this could be the cycle coin to go sub 28s again don't shoot me don't shoot me don't give out to me i'm just reading these charts man all right i think we're going i think we're going i think we're going down big time here i think this is going to go to 16,000 over the course of this year i think that's going to happen so and i think the the etfs bitcoin etfs have just been giving a huge amount of liquidity for people to be out of some bitcoin risk so you know
know, that's that. So look, let's put target on. Uh, let's put the target on. 16s. All right. Won't be long. Okay. That's it for another uh, another week. Look ahead. I um, hope you guys have a safe week. Um, stay lucky. And I'll talk to you next week. Cheers. Thank you.